claustrophobe sounds like? It sounds like a dish I had in a Romanian restaurant one time. Oh, Seriously. Yeah, it could be. It, no, no, it's no. Dark gravy with like onions and mushrooms. Claustrophobe. That's what it sounded like. I, you know. <laughs> Now, what did that make you manly, like it, like it, like it did for Tatis? Oh, <laughs> I still, I still can't believe that a ball player with that long of a contract that would not at least check with the team. It, it just, well, it just the story. It seems so weird. You know, he, he had tapeworm. I mean, come on, I, that's just unbelievable. A well, the thing is, yeah, we'll start out with this. You know. Uh, Go on, Jeff. Tell us where, who we are, and I'll, I'll jump in on Tatis. I got my own views. Uh, I'm trying to figure out who are we. Okay. Hey, folks, we're Daily Fish. We're live on Facebook at daily.fish.5, Monday, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. We are on so many different channels. Hey, you need to write to us because we got a lot of things to talk about. You can write to us at dailyfish1 at gmail.com. If you're watching us live right here, right now, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific right now. Uh, all you got to do is drop something in the chat box if you're listening and uh, watching us as well. So, uh, but anyway, so give me, give me your thoughts on Fernando Tatis. I, I think we shared it. We talked about this morning on our morning walk across country, you and Myrtle Beach and me in Las Vegas. <laughs> and that when this is a second violation, John, and when you have a second violation, every single substance you take, if you go to a GNC, and get a vitamin C supplement. You got to go to the team nutritionist and every team in the in, Matt, in the National Football League and Major League Baseball. I don't know about the NBA and NHL. They have a team nutritionist, and they say you know you don't take this because there's something that there's something in there that's considered a banned substance. He didn't do it. He's got a 345 million dollar guaranteed contract, and the general manager. You'll bring up his name. You know what? I don't offhand of the of the San Diego Padres was vehemently. De- upset and said this kid needs to get mature and there's people that have his back there's there's people out there uh baseball players that are saying i'm not mentioning names but there's baseball players out there that said you know what mistakes are being made yeah then you pay his fucking salary yeah no absolutely and you know he did apologize and he did feel uh, horrible about it but i think he he obviously, uh, you know, moved ahead and not, didn't ask permission and just says, oh, I'll, I'll ask for forgiveness. Well, that, that's not working because the Padres are now without him for 41 games at the end of this season. Could be more games if, uh, how far they go in the playoffs and then probably another 40 games at the beginning of next season. So, you know, when they were looking at a team with, with, with Tatis in there, with Soto, uh, along with Machado, I mean, they were really looking at something good. At the same time, too, I mean, they still could be – you know, they're not playing good after that uh, trade, uh, but you never know uh, because I think there's a lot of teams that are going to start getting hot in September because there's a lot of teams that aren't hot right now. So, except the Baltimore Orioles. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, again, it's about the tease and it's about stupidity. And, and yeah. he could be remorseful all he wants, but there's fans of the San Diego Padres that really want to make a run. The beautiful stadium. I've been down to that stadium. It's one of the most beautiful stadiums and most beautiful parts. The gas lamp district, gas lamp district in San Diego, just most unique restaurants around there. And I want that team to be successful because that's all they got. That's all they got. They don't have anything else. There's no basketball, football, and there's no hockey. So it's a great city. I go down there and party all the time. I go surfing down there. And I, I don't root for the Padres, but I do. That makes sense. I'm a Dodger fan, but I don't hate them like I do the Giants. So it's a bad situation, and when are teams going to learn? Stop giving these long guarantee contracts. Stop. Yep, I agree. I agree. Not many of them worked out. All right, hey, let's move on to a little football here. Um, you know, you mentioned something to me this morning about the the fact that stadiums are eliminating tailgating for football. Is that true? All of them. The Raiders don't have it. They have a small little lot J. But if you remember going to the Oakland Coliseum, you had lot C, D, and B, which were yeah. huge. And part of the experience of going to a game, you went to games as a kid. Every stadium had huge parking lots and you, the smells of the barbecues going and people having their campers out there. And a guy has his TV set watching the morning games. And you could walk by someone and say, how you doing? They go, you want a hot dog? You want a sausage dog? They don't do that anymore. They want to eliminate that. They want to get you into the stadium to purchase all the beverages, adult beverages, and food that you can. Here's the problem. Okay. When you get lit up, and I have on some t- tailgate parties, two things happen either you pass out by the first quarter or at least by <laughs> halftime you're done 
Now people are getting lit. I'm a bartender, so people getting lit these games. They stop in the third quarter. It causes more. There's more altercations now in football games because people are just power drinking at the game. They might tailgate somewhere else in pregame at a bar or a restaurant, but it's still it's the tradition of tailgating that that that's missing in new stadiums in Atlanta and Minnesota and the Raiders and SoFi in, in L.A. What do you think, John? So so what you're saying? Let, let, let me get this straight. So you're saying that. Um, they're not drinking out of tailgating. They're drinking when they go in to the stadium. That's that's where they're drinking. And because the cost of the booze is probably a lot higher, they're probably not as drunk. Is that what you're it's saying? It's about making it's, – it's, it's all the bottom line. I get it. The, the, the people building the stadiums in the cities are right. Let's get them in the stadium and charge, you know, $15 for a can of bread you can get for $7 at a, at a local bar. I get that. And the drinks, I mean, a shot, you get a, a shot of Jameson at Allegiant or at uh, with a Knights play at T-Mobile. A shot, $21. A shot. Wow. Shot of Jameson. I bought a round of T-Mobile one time for six people. It was $140. I don't care. I cared. I put on my credit card, but that's how they get you. And if they can, and they will, and they do. I've um, One of the last tailgatings I went to was in Jacksonville outside of Jaguars game. And I got to tell you, that was fun. And there were people out there. I mean, they literally, it's like, it's like a menu. They set the whole thing up. So I don't know if they're doing it now because I haven't been to a, NFL game in, ooh, it's got to be at least three or four years now, uh, thanks to COVID. Um, but I've been to some tailgating at some college football games. Uh, I was at an NC State game, and oh my God, I mean, that whole parking lot was just completely filled up. So I, I'm, I would imagine college football still probably has some pretty good tailgating, whereas you're saying the NFL doesn't. Yeah, a good point. Maybe this is also true, John. In college football, you can't really serve booze in a lot of stadiums. You're going to be in line forever looking at people's IDs because a lot of those kids, you're under 21, you're 18, 19, and 20 year olds going to the game. So a lot of booze is banned in a lot of those stadiums. So yeah, they're going to they're going to tailgate and get their get their high on and their and their drink up uh, in college games. But all the newer stadiums are not having big parking lots. They're having shuttles and buses. My son and I take a bus from a very nice casino for two dollars. You know, but we, we do our thing and, and it's it's I get it. I'm just saying the tradition of it's going away. And it's something that we we educate young people on this show about things you did in the past. Well, and that was a fun part. It was a part of going to a football game was part of it. I, I agree with you. And is, is it also I mean, the Vegas situation is, is because, you know, it's right on the strip there. So there's not a whole lot of room for parking. So that's probably another reason why you're losing that influence. So I guess what I would say is folks, if, you, if you're listening to us and you can tell us wherever you're at, do you still see tailgating? And if you do, where is it? Uh, you know, let us know, drop us a line, dailyfish number one at gmail.com. And we'll take a look at that. Okay. Now that's, to me, that hurts if there's no tailgating, but what also hurts is there's a lot of injuries going on in preseason and it's, it, you know, it's kind of becoming a little epidemic here. To, to me, the, the two big ones are uh, the Brown center, Nick Harris, um, and then the Jets quarterback, Zach Wilson, even though I, I don't think he's going to be gone long. I'm just, I'm worried about him in, in, in this, his what, his second year, second year, is his third year or second year? The second year. He was a rookie last year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So he needs, he needs, he needs some snaps. So uh, you know, the Jets that had a great draft, I'm wondering if this is going to hurt them. So w w what's your take on this and what's your solution? I'm on the fence. I mean, you, you need these guys to practice, obviously, and get the reps in and practice. But the bottom line is, I'll go back to the, the one thing. There's one thing good about COVID is that the injuries were lessened in 2020 because you walked in the building. To the left, it said testing. You took your test, rapid test to the right classroom. And they, and they did. then they took each individual room, wide receiver room, running back room, quarterback room, defensive backs, and they worked out in the weight room. But they never had contact because of COVID. OK, and everyone said, oh, my God, the level of play is going to be horrible in week one. Well, the Raiders went out and beat the Carolina Panthers 33-30. Carr had a phenomenal game. And I looked at that. If we were doing a podcast back then, that would have been a major topic. How's the level of play? And injuries are down. My point being, I want your take on this, is that you don't need to see. Aaron Rodgers hasn't played a preseason game, uh, I think, since the Sopranos <laughs> were on. He doesn't. <laughs> They don't play these big-time players. Don't play preseason games. I don't get it. I saw Daniel Jones take a massive hit against the Patriots. I saw Mahomes take a hit, and your heart starts to flutter. You know, the Raiders have lost two offensive linemen. They've lost Brandon Parker and Denzel Good in the preseason. It aggravates you. Injuries are part of the game. Well, I don't use cliches, but it's true. 
but let them happen in the regular season. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I think uh, I, there's still a lot of young players that are coming up that are either not drafted or just been drafted and they got to prove themselves. So I think you do need some games like that. But I agree with you. They can cut back and maybe have just two or three games and then just let, let's move on. Uh, a lot of it, though, I think it's, it's money because a lot of these teams make money off the uh, advertising and the uh, television rights. The local teams do because they they don't. You know, they don't get it during the regular season. They just get it on the overall from the NFL. So anyway, that's that's what we do. That. But yeah, I, I would agree with you. It, to me, you know, I'm not watching a lot of preseason. I'm watching it, but I'm not really I'm paying attention maybe to the first quarter or so. And then I'm maybe paying attention to a couple of players that I'm worried about or I'm thinking about. Are they going to make the team or not? So anyway, um, let's move on here. The next Tiger Woods is there. The next Tiger Woods. Is there a Tiger Woods coming? Go ahead. You You, you start on that first. Your favorite sport is golf. Your golf and baseball. What's well, great? Mm-hmm. We have a baseball. You know everything about these sports. Like I know football. Okay. Mm-hmm. My problem That's with golf. Why we work well together. Uh, and you play golf. You know, and we <laughs> both played baseball. But the bottom line, who cares about us? The bottom line is, when Tiger Woods makes the cut, the ratings are up sixty-two to seventy percent. And golf has done a horrible job of marking that baseball has. I don't want to see commercials in baseball with Ken Griffey Jr., Randy Johnson, A. Rod, and the Hurt talking about we need guys now and the live hasn't helped it's great it's great a fodder for us to talk about if we get attention to golf where's the next tiger where's the next guy that they can market that has that personality and 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 drive is it because he's african-american that he's gotten that that he brings that audience in i don't know because he he, he appeals to everybody he's just a great kid who cares what color he is but where's that next guy Where's the next person that's going to come in and say, I'm taking golf to the next level as far as marketing. You're going to follow me. Football does great because there's Joe Montana, there's Steve Young, there's Peyton Manning, there's Tom Brady. Now we're looking at Mahomes and Josh Allen. Okay, there's always someone. Baseball is the same thing. They're just not marketing those honeys. Where is it in golf? Because the ratings should be up no matter who makes the cup in those majors. Yeah, You would think, but uh, I think I, I, don't, I don't think there is another Tiger. Um, I think Tiger was, was, you know, bigger than Jack, bigger than Arnie. Um, you know, you, you can go back to the, you know, Gene Saracen and some of the, some of the big ones back there, but, um, there were certain things that happened with Tiger. Uh, it, it, it was not because of his color. It wasn't because he was Asian. It wasn't because he was black. It was because he changed the game and, you know, a, a champion golfer up, up until that time was usually kind of chubby. And, and out of shape and kind of hit the ball, yeah, hit the ball good, but never crushed the ball, was never in shape. Tiger totally changed the game to the point that almost every player that's on the PGA Tour today can say, the reason I got into the game was because of Tiger. Uh, I just don't think there is a figure, a, a, a person who can change the game now it's 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 years down the road, maybe decades down the road, and even then, golf might not be much of a sport in the next but couple of decades. Don't you think? Don't you think he's been such a a, a booster and a mentor to young African American kids to get into the sport, like Serena? We're going to talk about later. Yeah. That's yeah. just such a just such a high figure and someone. Hey, this is someone we could root for. You know, this is someone that looks like oh, yeah. me. It's, I you know I don't, when they, I think yeah, there's and, and, that, and that helps. I, I guarantee you. Let me ask you this. I'll ask Hardison when he comes on. If Tiger Woods changed the game with the way he hits the ball, you know, and he was as white looking as your as your brother John Daly, would they care? Would people care? I mean, um, so he I, tournaments. I mean, would, would, would he bring in a different demographic? No. If the guy was, you know, if, if the guy was, uh, uh, you know, looked like you or me, would he bring in a different demographic? Probably not. You know, he, 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 probably, he probably wouldn't, but he still would have been monumental for the game because his his game wasn't just he, he was a black man or an Asian guy. Uh, it was the fact that he he could hit the ball a ton, but his mindset. Tiger didn't win games or didn't win all those championships because he hit the ball a long way. It's because he was an incredible putter and he knew how to stay out of trouble. He and he had uh, he had a lot of great creativity. So you just, but, you but, just screwed yourself. How's that? Go ahead. Because so, because of his putter, he got himself in a lot of trouble. Well, he did. That's true. But but that, you know that's that's just being that's just being like you and me. It has nothing to do with that. But he no. um, 
but I, I, I think he's, he's just created so many people, so many great golfers there that I don't think there's anybody that's going to rise up and, and, and overtake him. Now, if he hadn't had these injuries, I, I still think he would have been on top of his game. He would have, he would have obliterated Jack's uh, majors record. Um, so I think he would have been, I think he could have been around and, you know, he could have been playing for another five, 10 years on a regular basis if he wanted to, if he didn't have the problems that happened. But I just, I don't see anybody coming up. I don't see anybody changing the game, uh, the way he did. I think he's, he's, he's a monument. He's a monument to golf. And I, I don't, yeah, I don't, absolutely. I don't see anything else coming. And there's, and there's so many good players out there now, right. but none of them are really, you know, standing out and really, uh, changing the way things are. All right. Hey, um. Let's talk about binge watching. What are you binging now? Two, real quick. I'm, oh my God! You remember this train wreck on Netflix? Oh, Three part cool. series about Woodstock, 1999. And my God, what a shit show that was! 250,000. They didn't prepare. They didn't. There was not enough porta potties. There wasn't enough food, water. 250,000 drunk idiots out there and druggies. Great, great bands from Limp Bizkit to Corn, Bush, yep. uh, Jewel, James Brown opened the show. Real quick, they gave everyone candles at the end of the show to celebrate the weekend. <laughs> the Red Hot Chili Peppers are on there, and they start lighting fires, little fires. Yeah. So they yeah. get to Anthony Kiedis, the lead singer, of, and he said, can you tell people to put the fires? So what does he do? He plays the song Fire by Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> also, watch Legacy on Hulu, the real story of the Lakers. It's I thought the winning championship on HBO was great. This is better because it's all the interviews with these guys. It's a documentary. Magic yeah. runs it, and Kareem and Michael Cooper, phenomenal. Now, are, are they? I, when I saw that, and I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but is that kind of counteracting the the fictional series that was on before? Well, this is the real truth. You always got to tell them the story. Yeah, it's the same stories. They don't go into the, the non. They don't go into the you know bus having these parties. They talked about it. He has a lot of interviews before he died. And his kids. It's yeah. Magic Kareem, Michael Cooper, Norm Nixon, the bus kids, bus talking about buying the team, and great footage that they didn't show. And that other thing, Westhead talking about taking over from McKinney. It's actually to me, it's more intriguing than the which is a than the winning time with John C. Roddy was great and Adrian Brody. This is more intriguing because when they tell the real stories, it means more to me. You know, uh, I'm, I'm real quickly. I'm going. I'm I'm going kind of historical too. I'm doing the uh, Teddy Roosevelt series, three part series on the History Channel. Uh, it's a docudrama. It's got actors playing the characters, but it also has commentary in there from historians. I think it's really good. It's really good for someone to take a look and see what happened turn of the century when Teddy Roosevelt right. became president. All right. We've got some fish like memes. What do you got this? Yeah, one? Let, let's let's do a little uh, a couple of memes here. Um, I'm going to uh, this guy <laughs> meant a lot. Another football meme. This guy meant a lot to you and me. This guy started it. Look at this picture. This is for our listeners uh, out there. This yeah. is Lenny Dawson. Great quarterback. Yeah. NFL Hall of Famer. He's smoking a cigarette in this picture on the sideline, which was allowed back in the day. He just went into hospice, and he started a show that's been a national brand in America, John, called Inside the NFL. That's now on um, it's on Paramount, but he started with Nick Bonacani, and he's been did it for 35 years. And he's in hospice, and to his family, again, we lost Scully. We're going to lose this guy, and and great person, great philanthropist, and. Just a great everything. Great. Remember him, John? Look at him. Look at oh, him smoking at the sideline. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And everybody and, always said what a great guy he was. Yeah. Yeah. He's like you. Great guy. And But, you know, I don't know if you smoke cigarettes on the sidelines of real TV. Not me. Maybe maybe that's why Ahmad Rashad took your job. You wouldn't smoke anything. <laughs> Anyways, here's another meme. This is the, this is, this is the Raiders, Dave Ziegler and Josh McDaniel. <laughs> and the, the caption, Ziegler says, dude, we made all these moves and they still try to say we're going to finish last. And McDaniels looks at him and says, "Fuck them all." <laughs> <laughs> so that that's my memes of the day, but it's yeah, the, the Raiders have no respect. Look great in the preseason, but again, it's just the preseason. Yeah, it's still, and they're they're in to me the best division. So uh, we'll see. Right. All right, hey folks, questions or comments, drop them in the chat box. If you're watching us live, if you're not, email us at dailyfish1 at gmail .com. Again, we are Daily Fish. We're live on Facebook at daily.fish.5. That's on Mondays. 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. Watch us also on Facebook at Myrtle Beach Golf Channel and Myrtle Beach Grand Strand Life. Check out Daily Fish on YouTube and Wingding TV. We're also on Hey Vegas TV. That's at heyvegastv.com. Listen to us on Spotify, Apple, iHeart, Stitcher, and Amazon. And use all those channels to hear our interview chats with our special guests. 
and you're going to have a lot more coming up this week on that. All right, now it is time for our schmuck of the week. Who's been schmucky this week, Fish? Okay. John doesn't really know what I'm doing right here. This is unbelievable. This is Prince <laughs> Harry. That's his underwear. <laughs> Prince <laughs> Harry's royal jewel, jewels, jewels, royal jewels must be priceless. His auction went up for his underwear went up for auction daily from a strip billiard game in Sin City, and it's already at a quarter of a million dollars. And they're doing this thing until September 30th, and they think it's going to garnish somewhere close to a million dollars. The bidding opened with ex stripper Carrie Royal producing the goods, the Prince's black undies from a memorable night in a high roller suite. Now, I look at Prince Harry and I think to myself, his underwear is going to go for a million dollars. And I look at this guy and I say, What's his underwear? That's, that's a lookalike. It's Carson Wentz, everyone out there. Yeah. Listen, yeah. This is exactly yeah. like Prince Harry. Let me ask you something, John. What do you think your underwear would go at an auction? I don't know, but Megan gets the two of them mixed up all the time because I see her at the uh, uh, at the Colts games. Uh, my underwear would probably go for uh, a match, so they would probably light it and get rid of it, um, especially when you know my history of going to the bathroom, right? Well, my, mine's bad. I went to the doctor. We need to be our age. I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, I need an example of your urine, stool, and semen. I said, take my underwear. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All righty. All right, let's see who has got the swag this week. Who are we toasting this week, Fish? You know, there, we, we, there's a problem I talk about it when we do uh, our pol political segment. I got two of them. First of all, the, the, the great one is this guy. Now, this guy, I don't know if this is just happened the other day. I don't know mm -hmm. if this is apropos for Mark Davis. We stand him with all these cheerleaders because all the stuff that's going on back the scenes with lawsuits against the Raiders. But I'll tell you what kind of person is this. There, there's a report out there, and Scarlett Johansson kind of uh, verified that two and a half out of every nine kids in America is hungry. What does Davis do every year? He gives $500,000 to the Clark County School Bank. So every kid that's in grade school, gets a hot breakfast and a hot lunch. And I don't care what happens. This is a tremendous human being, and that means swag. I mean, I, I just love everything about the philanthropy this, this guy does. And then there's another swag board. This goes out to John Daly and myself and everyone. And this is my favorite free. Check out these two dogs. Just <laughs> kill it. Now, I, I believe this. I've had a golden retriever my whole life. Kid, now, you see sometimes people see Molly laying in the mm -hmm. back over here. I believe this, John, and you love your dog, Nike. I believe if every human had the disposition of a golden retriever, there'd be zero strife in the world. Look at those yeah, two. Absolutely. Just absolutely. That's my swag dog that, right there. Wow. That is that is a great shot. looks like they're glamping as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what it looks like? This is going to be you and me when we're 90. <laughs> 90. You know, you know what? Do you know when you get older, you grow hair in places? Like you get hair in your nose and your ears. That's you and me at 90. There's you on the left falling asleep. What do you mean yeah. Tiger Woods doesn't complain anymore? Hey. And I'm like, there's me on Where's the. My, there's me on the I, I need my grooming. I need my grooming tool. Right. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. You have makeup artists being a dog. But yeah, we have two <laughs> dogs out there, folks, that are sitting in front of a campfire on lounge chairs, just chilling it up. So get get on one of our visual sites and check this out. It'll make your day. Absolutely. All right. Good stuff. All right. For our drink of the week, we're going to bring in. The Hardline. He is John Hardison for the Cost of Winning podcast, focusing on fantasy sports and sports betting. Hardline, welcome, buddy. Good to have you on. We're going to jump into some stuff in a bit. But first, Fish, what is our drink of the week? Well, I, I'm, I'm doing an Irish coffee, but I'm doing it with Jameson Orange. Because mm -hmm. Hardline came into Shuck's Tavern on Saturday and said, do you have any Jameson Orange? Yeah, it's great in a coffee drink. And we're saluting the Notre Dame fighter. I'm not a Notre Dame fan. But Hardline, they started out college football practice, and college football starts in 12 days. And you know what that means to us on the show. It means more bets, more prop bets. So, Jameson Orange, to, to the Fighting Irish, to the Irish like daily. You know, what's your background, Hardison? What are you? What's your background as far as uh, lineage, as far as uh, eth we know your ethnicity? But what's, what's your uh, bad? What, what, uh, what, uh, let me see. Are you Puerto Rican? What are you? Uh, Puerto Rican, a little, a little Irish. Uh, a little Italiano, you know. I got a little bit of everything in me. You're, you're a smorgasbord. I see, smorgasbord. I see the Italian. I see that. Perfect. I got a little. I got a little of everything in me, and I put a little of everything back. If you get what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right, man, Pete. Irish coffee is our drink of the week. Oh, you just kicked them out. What did you do that for? I, did, I, don't, I didn't kick them out. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, you can see that too. Yeah, 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 you can. He's been kicked out of bars before, I'm sure. All that right. The family the reunion. Drink of the week is sponsored by Shucks Tavern in Vegas. Great seafood and drinks in two locations. Head to the Shucks Tavern on North Durango on the northwest side of town where fish is overnight. Say Daily Fish Podcast. Guess what? You get a free drink. Do it the next day. Say a free appetite. You say Daily Fish, you get a free appetite. That's what I should be saying. Again, that is Shucks Tavern. Check out Shucks Tavern on Facebook. All right, let's jump into the hard line here. We've got, we're going to go over some bets, but hard line, hey, one that hits you first, because we were kind of discussing this ourselves uh, before we got on the air. Um, Serena Williams, she, you know, she's she's about ready to become a mommy full time and maybe uh, hang up the racket. What, what, what do you think of her legacy? Give, give us give us some thoughts on that. Uh, you know, Serena, Serena Williams, her legacy is wrapped in these three things. And, and it, I thought about it when you asked me the question uh, prior to the show. Beauty, dominance and grace. I think those are the three things that really come to mind when we talk about her. Uh, she's inspired so many African-American young women to take up the mantle of tennis. I mean, when you especially you talk about Naomi Osaka, Coco Goff, uh, and, and a, a plethora of other ones to, to come by names of that. You know, when you think about tennis 30, 40 years ago, and we're talking about in the 80s and, uh, in 80s and 90s, you barely saw African-American women in this sport. I mean, they were predominantly white or European women. Um, and her ability to show women that you can compete on such a high level that she can do. And we've never even saw someone in, until we got Serena that brought in the endorsement money in terms of women athletes and especially women tennis players as well. I mean, from Nike to her own dress line to everything under the sun. I mean, you know, Fish has said it even, be even before when the Williams sisters play, not just even including Serena herself, but when the sisters play, the ratings go up exponentially. I mean, there there is no amount that you could say in, in terms of everything that she's done. And honestly, uh, for what she's accomplished, for everything that she's done, she's an Olympian, she's a Wimbledon winner. She set her own pace in her own lane. And when people told her that she couldn't wear something or shouldn't wear something, she wore it anyway and it became a hot seller. You know, yeah. to me, she's on, she's with the names of Everett, King, Nevitalova in court. I mean, when you bring up those names, you have to put Williams in that same conversation now. What? Let, let me ask you. The best ever. The best ever. I'm sorry, John. I want to say something. You go first. Yeah. Go. I was just going to say, you know, we, we were talking about Tiger before. Um, uh, do, do, do you put her in, in, in Tiger's shoes in a different sport? Absolutely. Absolutely. To me, she's the best that's ever done it. I mean, okay. to, to me, she's the best that's ever done it. I mean, I, you've never seen someone – in my opinion, as dominant as she's been. And, and the one thing that I say is there was a rule that they talked about um, a few years ago. I think it was at Wimbledon about women not grunting when they serve. They, they thought it was maybe too, uh, maybe too sexual because of the sound that they were making when they did it. And S Serena Williams, they asked her about it. She was like, this is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life. Look, you know, you go out there, you're here to dominate, you're here to win. And look, her game is based on power. It's a power game that she has. And, and I think that's the greatest thing. When we talk about even Tiger Woods, his game is, is dominance of power. So is Serena Williams. And I mean, it shows. It shows what every – anytime somebody plays her, they look like they're shaking in their boots because they don't know how fast or how hard that ball is coming towards them. Yeah. My, my take is she's the greatest ever. Ever and I, you are everything you read about her. The way she was raped, the way what, what, what Richard did. I watched that movie was phenomenal. The way he tutelaged tutelage these girls and mentored them. But my point being that I didn't get out before about Tiger Woods. You said that she inspired young African American women to play the sport. And you, but Sloane Stevens is another one that that that, that that's terrific. Don't you think that young African American men? were inspired by Tiger Woods. That's what I'm saying. It's the same thing to watch a sport. And that's why when these ratings are up 62, same thing. When Serena makes the makes the, the semifinals and finals, the ratings are up on those events 60 to 70%. Don't you think it's a demographic of young African Americans say, let's do this. Let's kick it. Let's kick, let's kick ass in a white dominated sport. Sorry. I, I, yeah, I, I absolutely oh, this agree. Is. This is a daily fish. And it is, you know, no, nope. I absolutely no, I absolutely agree. I think that I I think that she has. I think the same thing with Tiger. Um, we haven't seen as many in the PGA as of lately as much as we've seen 
in professional tennis, but I think, you know, it's coming. I think that it's something, but I think you have to have somebody that's there that dominates and makes people think differently to want to do it. I mean, we've talked about this fish numerous times about baseball when they say African-Americans don't play baseball, but there's not a lot of African-American representation in baseball. And compared to when you were watching it back in the seventies and eighties. Oh yeah. We talked about this morning. Remember that daily? Yeah, Stephen Stephen A. Smith said there's 7.2% of African-Americans, 7.2 play baseball, you know, but it's great that getting back to Serena Williams and I follow tennis and I just, I, I love the sport. I have men and women. She's one of the greatest ever. Okay. And cause she did like, and she was graceful and she, you know, you know, she went through a lot of shit too, you know, and her sister was great. It's a great story. And I'm glad that she's finally getting a lot of endorsements. That endorsement she has where she's in the mall, hit the tennis balls and she knocks a drink out of McEnroe's hand. Yeah. One of the best commercials <laughs> ever, you know, um, <laughs> But you know what I don't want to see female tennis players do? Stop with the feminine deodorant spray commercials. It doesn't look good. It doesn't, you know. I want to see a really good, a really good looking young, skinny girl about 15 say, This is my mom. You know, I, I don't want to see, I don't want to see it. I'm done. Yeah, hey, there was one. Her name was Anna Kurnikova, and uh look how that career went. <laughs> you know what? Look at Sharapova. Sharapova was one and twenty-six against Serena. But it had a shitload of, of endorsement. That bothered the shit out of me. I'm sorry, it did. You know, yeah. but that doesn't work that way. Beauty, beauty sells. You know, Danica Patrick's still the number one, number one John endorser of all. Never won an NASCAR event. But yeah. it, it, have you seen her? She's gorgeous, and she's a good person. And she's a good person too. Yeah, absolutely. Good person. All right, let's move on to some uh, betting. We got the hard line here. We got the expert. Um, is betting on preseason football is that a waste of time? It most certainly is a waste of time. Granted, you know, the overs went eight for eight, but it's a waste. You don't know who's going to play that game. You don't know how much time that person is going to play. You might get a, a starter that goes in for two series and that's it. And even now what we're talking about in terms of Zach Wilson and all the injuries, you're not going to get starters. You don't even know. If I told you the second or third string wide receiver on the Steelers, you'd ask me who. Who is that even person? It's not even worth it. You don't know. I tell people, save your money. If you're going to bet right now, you got to itch. Go ahead and go for uh, for baseball. It's a little bit more of a surefire thing going with baseball right now than, play, than trying to bet preseason football. Okay. Hey, we brought it up in the toast. College football starts in like 12 days. Give me five sleeper teams in Division One football that aren't, aren't basically in the top 10 that could sneak in. I'll give you Michigan State, Cal Golden Bears. I'll go Minnesota, Texas, and uh, – you know what? I actually like them in the ACC. We'll see how they do this year. Uh, I'll put Miami on there. I'll put Miami on there. Okay. Um, I've, I've got a good friend. His name is Raleigh Rick Meadows. Done a lot of stuff with him. Uh, he, he was on an undercover jet setter with us. In fact, we got to get him on the show. He's an NC State grad. What do you think of NC State? This I, think it's, I think NC State's good. I think that it's going to come down to – one of three teams in the ACC, I think it's going to come down to either NC State, Pitt, or Clemson. It just depends on what Clemson team we get this year. Last yeah. year, it wasn't the Clemson team that we thought that's been as dominant as they have in the past. And, you know, look, Pitt still got our, you know, Pat Narduzzi. Loved him when he was defensive coordinator at Michigan State. And I think, you know, look, he's produced the first-round draft pick and uh, and Kyle P in, in Pickett. And, look, he lost another first-round draft pick in Addison that ended up transferring. But yeah. – Look, he's going to be a first-round pick. Uh, you bring up the Clemson thing, and it's really interesting because what I'm noticing here, and there's a lot of Clemson fans around here, they think this is kind of a year of either Clemson comes back to being on top or maybe this is the decline. Do you do you see – can you can you have any sort of a crystal ball as far as that goes? Uh, I think this is – I think they got it right. I think this is a bit of a make-or-break year. Uh, I think that it all depends on – how they start off their season, but I also think it depends on what we see out of Miami. I mean, look, Miami is the team in the ACC that gets a lot of heavy recruits, and with their new head coach, if they just, if they start getting that mojo back a little bit, it could scream a little bit trouble for Clemson. Okay, cool. Sounds good. All right, what else we got there, Fish? Uh, we wild got, card. Uh, hey, give me give me a wild card in Major League Baseball that can possibly upset Dodgers, Yankees. Mets. Uh, you That's know what? I'm, 
I'll what? give you the Seattle Mariners. They have been playing very well as of late. Uh, I think that they'll get one of the wild card spots. I watched their series versus the Yankees uh, last week when they played them in Seattle, and the Yankees struggled. And I mean, look, right now, I think it's good that the Yankees are losing. That way, they keep trying to get some of this out uh, and be more prepared for the postseason. But Seattle's got a lot of teams' names right now, and they've been putting up really good numbers. I think that that's a team to watch out for in the AL. If we're, ta- in, if we're talking about the NL, I like the Padres. I mean, look, that first round matchup, if the Padres get that second wild card spot, if they play the Mets, anything's possible. I mean, it really is. I mean, they invested in hitting. They invested in a lot in terms of their payroll. Don't be, uh, don't discount both of those teams, I think, moving forward. Don't, I, well, I've got my pick, John. You give one. I like the Atlanta Braves, I, I think, as a wild card team. The match free, they have a lot of injuries right now. They're all coming back September 1st, and they're probably going to be a wild card. We just won the World Series. I'm just going on past history. They play the Dodgers really well too. So, yeah, I would say I, I, I'm I'm with uh, Hardline. I I was saying the Seattle Mariners. There's a, there's a part of me that wants to, and this is because of you, Fish. I want to say the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, I think they're going to win you your bet. I just I I think that they're going think- to. Well, I know they're going to win the bet because if, if they go three, if, if they go three and forty. If they go three and forty-five and I lose my bet, I'll be the laughing stock of every goddamn podcast in the world. It, it'll be a conspiracy. Well, well, I, well Fish, you're, you're close on the Orioles. We'll, we'll see what happens. But we nailed it on the Angels. They haven't won eighty games in like six years, and they, they still stink. can't win eighty games. Stink. No, definitely, no doubt right. about that. All right, and that is the Daily Fish Hardline with John Hardison, the Cost of Winning podcast. You can find him here with us, but he's also on Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcast with the Cost of Winning podcast. Hardline, stick around, buddy. We got more to talk about because more controversy ahead. After all, folks, we are Daily Fish coming to you from Las Vegas and Myrtle Beach. We hit issues you are talking about, sports, entertainment, politics, and everything in between. Controversial, but informed. No woke, no extreme, no Karens here, or social justice cops. We let the threes fly. We aim for the third deck. It's a bumpy ride, but it's going to be fun. All right, folks, again, questions or comments, drop it in the chat box. If you are watching us live, if you're not watching us live, email us at dailyfish, the number one, dailyfish1 at gmail.com. Also, folks, hey, you need a great golf getaway. The Myrtle Beach Golf Trail has dozens of courses along the Carolina coast. I can tell you how good it is down here now. Let me tell you. Set up an entire trip for yourself, your family, a bunch of friends, the site is the MyrtleBeachGolfTrail.com. You can play there year-round as well. Hey, and folks, don't forget our interview show is coming up. We have Linda Cohn from ESPN. She's coming up in about a week or so, so stay tuned for that. Watch us on this here. We will announce when we're going to have it as well. All right, let's move into our next thing. We've got a little politics here. Um, Fish, one of the things you, you pushed to me this morning, um, do you think uh, – Former President Trump is stronger or weaker after the Mar-a-Lago raid. What are you thinking? It depends what comes out of it. If it's if it's Geraldo Rivera when he unveiled that secret Capone, <laughs> Capone's bottle, and there's a bottle of Manischewitz wine in there. I mean, so far they got a letter from seriously, they got a letter from Obama, which basically said to him, "You need, need to get your hairstyle a little bit better, more like Mark Davis." And they found they found a actually they found a uh, a menu from a restaurant. I mean. What do you? Th- you're, you're our political correspondent. I don't. I don't know what to think. I think if nothing comes out of it, it makes him stronger. It, 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 all the all the people that are going to say make him a martyr. See, they're going after this guy, and they found nothing. That's what I think. I agree with you. It depends what's in there. It, it, it'll it'll affect a lot of things. I, I think if I had to if I had to bet, I would say he's going to be indicted. Um, I, I I do think Merrick Garland's going to indict him. And I, I don't think Merrick Garland would be doing what he's doing unless he, unless there's some really good stuff in there. The other thing that just happened today, they actually closed that uh, affidavit because Merrick Garland does not want anybody knowing what's in that thing yet. So, um, so that's happening. I, if, you know, if I had to guess, I I would think he's going to be indicted now, whether, whether he'll be convicted or not, I don't know, but I think the outcome will be of the indictment Trump supporters will just be even stronger. And, you know, my fear is, is that he's got some supporters that are kind of, you know, Unabomber types. So that's that's the only thing I'm I'm a little worried about. Uh, but for the most part, I think I, 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 this this thing isn't going away. It's going to be around for a while. A lot of it's going to be determined about if the Republicans 
take the House and the Senate, uh, I mean, that's that's going to cause even more chaos once we get into January uh, and then leading into the 2024 election, because the Republicans will start. They'll be bringing up their own January 6th committees. Uh, so there's there's a there's a lot of chaos coming up that I would say, you know, buckle up, folks. Hardline, give us your take. No, I think both of you are, are correct in what you're saying. Look, I think depends on what side of the die you're looking at. I think if you're um, I think if you're more of a conservative, I say you like this is look at it. The system's trying to get him. This is what he's been talking about. They've been coming after this guy. And look, he's he's being John Gotti, Teflon Don. He's not caving. That's the type of guy that you want leading this country. If you're if you're kind of in the middle, you're kind of like, yeah, I kind of saw this coming. You know, look, he had a lot of things that were, you know, kind of behind closed doors uh, that were questionable. And I, I think that this was something that was going to happen sooner rather than later. It's just kind of surprising that it took this long to get to it. And I think if you're a liberal, I think you're like, finally, the, they're going after him. It took him long enough. Finally, the system is producing what it's supposed to produce and it's going after him. Uh, you're right. I think that John has has a lot of fodder in what he's saying in terms of 2024, which is depending on how this goes. If he's indicted and, and he's found, you know, guilty, I think people kind of step away from him a little bit. If he's indicted and he gets off, I think that now there's now the idea is look at our guy. No matter how much they keep throwing at him, he keeps standing up for him and he keeps going back. And you know they can't knock him down. He's Rocky. You know, no matter you can punch him 18 times, he'll get up 19. So I think that this it's a big thing. I think if you're gonna go for this. And I think if you're going for this and this is where you're going to, you know, draw your line in the sand, you better be sure that you got enough to go through with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm changing gears a little bit here. Something that's very disturbing and dear to my heart, and I do philanthropy with my wife on this, is Scarlett Johansson has a great campaign going on. Now it's almost three out of every nine kids in America are going hungry. OK, and in countries throughout the world, Somalia, it's amazing. Nine hundred thousand people. You got to eat. You got to drink water and you got to breathe air. That's the, most, the three things you have to do to live. What are we doing about it? Why is there more programs out there to feed kids? We just talked about Mark Davis, who's a big part of my heart because he cares about feeding kids. What the fuck are we doing should be a main thing. We had the whole problem with, with, with the, with the uh, formula. They fixed that. But we need another formula to fix the bigger problem, and that's feeding our people. What, what's your take on it, guys? Go ahead, Hardline. Uh, I think it. I think a lot of it has to do with funding. I think a lot of it has to do with what the UN wants to do with these countries across the world and how they're going to uh, give them food or supplement or even do anything. And I mean, look, it's not just an issue that's worldwide. I mean, we talk about here, even in the city of Las Vegas, but there's a bunch of food deserts in the United States in which people can't get access to good, clean food. Um, it's an issue that's been going on for years. Uh, and I'll be the controversial person and I'll say it. I have moments where I think they don't want to solve this issue because if you solve the issue, then what else do you have to talk about? I don't think that there's people that are trying to fix it, but I think that there's an the overall aspect. It's better to have a problem that you can keep going back to than actually fixing it. You know what I mean? And, and I think that's the biggest problem overall is you don't have enough. Uh, I want to say governmental support or even United Nations support that people are putting their money where their mouth is, where they're saying, you know what? If we all just chip in as countries and we just say, you know what, we pull this together, we do everything, we can end this. I think people are like, eh, well, you know, I got to run for re-election. I need a couple of talking points. It's easier for me to do this. Uh, so I, now, I, I, go ahead, John. Go. No, I was going to say, I, I, I agree with you on that. But I, I think one of the bigger problems, especially worldwide, is, is the climate problem. Um, when you're looking at, uh, so for instance, the, the, the civil war in, in Syria. The only reason the civil war in Syria happened was because of climate change. Uh, those people, they couldn't grow crops. So what did they do? They ended up in Damascus. They overcrowded Damascus. And that's when you started getting the civil strife there. And that's when you started getting the fighting and things going on there. If you look at a lot of the countries, especially in Africa, especially in Latin America, uh, and even in parts of Asia, uh, they can't feed everybody. And that is one of the biggest problems uh, that's out there worldwide. Now add in what happened with uh, with Russia and Ukraine. So you're seeing less grain getting out there. Um, and so there's there's a real problem and there's technology there. We've had John O'Hurley on here before. He's got a technology called Gold Seal that it could grow crops in the middle of the desert 
And it's a technology that's waste to energy and the energy can create that. And I don't know why people aren't jumping all over. I want to bring up one other thing. When you talk about Scarlett Johansson, um, Blessings in a Backpack is a charity in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, I've done some work with them. They are absolutely fabulous. And what they do is, uh, because the kids, when we were talking about this before, uh, when you're talking about Mark Davis, uh, there are programs uh, that the schools do to feed the kids when they come to school because they, they don't have uh, they don't have a food at home. What Blessings in a Backpack does on Fridays, they bring a backpack in and they pack it with food so the kid can have food on the weekends because he's not at school getting fed. And he does that. Blessings in a Backpack. Check it out. They're, it's a great organization. They're all around the country in different parts of it. But it's yeah, it's it's another one of the problems that we're we're not facing. And as we run into this recession, I mean, it's it's the same thing that's that's it's going to be even exacerbated even more. Yeah. And an addendum to this. Let's fix it. This is fixable. Malnutrition yeah. is not for, for yeah. I agree with Hardline. But to say that, let's let this happen. Let's do Darwinism. Let's put up capitalism instead of lives. It doesn't work. We have to feed our people because, like I said, <laughs> you got to drink water, you got to eat, and you got to breathe air. And the climate change is affecting all that. Yeah. And but still, it's it, when I see these malnutrition kids, I I I I, I, I the anger. I, I'm in anger management as it is. I do this podcast to get out of anger management. Then I talk about shit that makes me angry. But this makes me angry. I don't care if you have kids or not. To see a picture of a malnutrition kid should go right to your heart, no matter what you are, Republican, Democrat, any human, and say, let's feed these kids. So out there, Daily, you know, maybe Daily Fish will start a GoFundMe page. I'm really into feeding kids because they're our future. Yeah, sorry. I agree. I agree. All right. One uh, one other thing we wanted to hit on was, um, or Hardline, do you have anything? Do you have any more, anything more to add to that? I'm sorry. I hope I didn't cut you off. Um, you, you you brought up this thing this morning to me, Fish, and you're saying, how come there's so much coverage on celebrities that die and not the common man? Give give, give me the example. You're talking well, about the I'll, answer. I'll give you a, one of the biggest tragedies that affected me personally as far as being a fan, when Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter crash, but there are still more people that died in it. Anne Hesh just is a terrific, great person, philanthropist, great actress. Mm -hmm. so, you know, she gets yeah. she drives her car into this house. People are injured in the house. The house is destroyed. It's all about it. We, we have such a voyeuristic society. And I mm -hmm. wonder if the line in Star Trek that the great John Luke Picard said is in the 24th century, we, we try and we work on making ourselves better people. There's no voyeurism. There's no money. There's no elitism. There's no status. It's all being about the same. I think it's sad that we always have to think about what the celebrity is going through and not the other people that are involved. I, I don't I don't think we ever get out of that because of our love of People Magazine, National Enquirer, and giving a crap every week who the hell the Kardashians are with. What do you think, Hardison? I just think that, you know, look, we're a society that's obsessed with death. And, and no matter what happens, we always go back to it. And it's something that uh, it's questionable. It, it's something that makes you think like, look, we keep talking about Natalie Woods, what, 30 years even after it happened. And we bring it up all the time. I think it's our idea of, of imprinting we want that life. We wish we had that life, you know, with everything that they're able to get and do. And if I maybe got even a piece of it, it would be something different. And, 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 and oh, maybe that's what they get because, look, they, they took for granted all the money that they made instead of doing something different. Uh, we are obsessed with it. And you're right. I thought the same way when Kobe Bryant passed, which was when he passed, it was sad. But I was like, you know, what about all the other six people? And the thing that I would constantly get from people is, well, yeah, that's sad too. But, oh, Kobe and Gigi. And I'm like, you, there's other people that died. He was a human being to begin with. Before he dribbled a basketball, he was a person. So, like, let's, no, let's not ignore – yeah, let's not ignore everybody else, unfortunately, that got on the helicopter and died as well. Yeah. John, you know – well, and one, one of the things, you know, in the book I wrote, wrote on the media bias was that I said we have a, a bias. We have a sports and entertainment bias in the news. And that's what gets people interested. And uh, it's also it, it gets people striving to 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 be somebody. Unfortunately, sometimes when they get to be somebody, they're not the somebody that they really want to be. But I, I think that that's just part of our American society. Um, I think it's something that, you know, parents need to talk to their kids about. You don't need to strive to be that great actor or actress that ends up having a, 
an addiction problem or, or something like that. But I do think um, it, it kind of keeps us going. And I, I think it also, um, you know, the outpouring for, for Anne Hay, and I, I agree with you. I thought she was, I thought she was a great person. I thought she was a really good actress. Um, but at the same time, too, there was something wrong. I mean, she had, you know, it could have been that she had an addiction there. Um, and at the, at, at, yet at, I thought the outpouring uh, from everybody, nobody seemed to condemn her, uh, even though at the time after she was brought in, I mean, the police were actually taking blood samples from her just because they were thinking they, they'd have to go in and convict her. Obviously, you know, unfortunately, she didn't make it. But um, so I think it's it's just part of our American um being that we have this sports and entertainment bias. We're just, we're drawn to that. And we would like to somehow be that. And we try to be that. And all of us are, you know, we're the heroes of our own story, no matter what it is. Um, and we see it in, not just in sports, but we, we see it all over. So it's, it's, it's kind of part of our being. And I think when something like this happens, um, you know, people like the three of us speaking up and saying, hey, you know, somebody else did pass away. You know, there are other people out there and there are other good people who have who have died, you know, trying to save other people. And, uh, you know, we, we, we try to do we try to report on that and show that as well. So but uh, but, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. Sometimes we're, we're we're overdoing it a little too much. But uh, uh, at the same time, too, they're part of our culture. They're they're what keeps us going. And there's there there's they they make life a little bit more interesting for us. But John, you know what? I, I'll, I'll add this to it, and this isn't necessarily about death. But as we talked about before, in terms of prior to the show uh, with Deshaun Watson, and look, we've had this conversation numerous times on the show about uh, the actions that he took. If Deshaun Watson was not a celebrity, and somebody told you that there was a guy that did what he did, you would walk on the other side of the street. Let's just be honest. Like if you told me that, I'd be like, there is no way in hell I'd associate myself with him. Yet, yep. there's going to be people that buy jerseys. There's going to be people that have, you know, free Watson. There's going to be a lot of people that are like, well, he's a celebrity and the rules are different. Free, free Watson. I love it. That's a, that's a, that's a, hey, so before I got, before I throw you guys under the bus, hardline, you said you're <laughs> Italian, African American. I, uh, is the Italian side of you trying to get a suntan? Because half of your face is white right now. <laughs> All right, I, I, you got some kind of sun thing going on. You're trying to get a little, you're trying to look like. Oh, yeah, yeah. You've got a little uh, glow. You got a glow. You're a handsome it's, man. People love seen, you with Chuck's Tavern. You're the better looking guy of the three of us. But this suntan during the show is a good look for you. All right, guys. We got a few minutes left. I gotta, I, I'm going to put you guys, I'm going to throw you guys under the bus. I'm going to put you on the spot. But I'm all, like John said, everything hangs loose. No Karens, all right? If I ask you guys this, I want your, and I want your, I want your opinions of your wives also. Okay. My wife and I have been married 33 years, and I always say to her, if I got a hall pass, if you had a hall pass, who would it be? And then I'll tell her who mine would be. Well, I'll go first, okay? She said if she had a hall pass, in other words, she's taking a shower, Ryan Gosling, okay, Idris Elba, if I've been pronouncing his name right, or George, George Clooney could walk in the shower, right? And I got no say, all right? I'm done. <laughs> me, me, okay, it's any girl that rejected daily back in the day, no. But um, I love Rihanna. I love Rihanna, and I love Kate Beckinsale. If they walk to my shower, my wife has no say. I'm going to go to Partisan first on this one because Daly's really struggling with this. Yeah, because I'm, I'm <laughs> struggling with this one. This is like, oh, God. I, I got it. So this, is, this will make podcast. So for, don't, put, don't throw your wives in this. Hardison, if your wife gave you a hall pass, it's never going to happen, you know. My luck, I get Ruth Fuzzy and she's dead. But what about you, Harlan? Uh, you know what? I'm going to take Woody Johnson's ex-wife because I know she loves brothers. As I'm not <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can, I can find, I can finagle that into something a little bit bigger. I can get her to give me a house in my name. I know she's good for the money because I know where I can find Woody at. Yeah, well, I, she's going to yeah. find Woody on you because you're bigger than Woody. <laughs> 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 you don't have a second. There's not a second woman. Yeah, I, I met your wife. Your wife. Your wife is gorgeous. You outkick your yeah. coverage. She's not going to mind you talking about this on a podcast because it's all I, fantasy. Pri prior to her, prior to her getting with the billionaire, I would say Serena Williams. That that was the one. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, gracious. And then she got with a guy that's a billionaire, and I was like, yeah, I'm punching a little bit out of my class here. Look I got to be there. Guess what, man? I put you on the spot. You're turning white. Look at you. 
<laughs> hey, I'm I'm, re I'm remaking the movie Ghost right now. Uh, you know. <laughs> I love this. Daily, uh, forget. I don't put your beautiful wife Terry into this because she's got class. But if she gave you a hall pass, um, I, oh, man. Penelope Cruz, maybe, uh, maybe. Yeah. She's gorgeous. Yeah, she's gorgeous. Yeah, but I just, I, I guess I just, I never think about that. So <laughs> wait a minute, she was. Oh, gee, you know what? I, I swear to God, Hardline, we could sell this show if we can get this guy to say shit or fuck or talk about shit like this. <laughs> is, Penelope, is Penelope Cruz, is she married to Javier Bardem? Is that the one? Or is mm -hmm. it Salma Hayek? Mm -hmm. I believe Cruz so. Cruz is, right? Yeah. You know why Daly? You know why Daly? Salma Hayek is another one for me. Say again? Salma Hayek is another one for me as well. Okay, well, you know the reason why you can't say Penelope Cruz? Because you're too, <laughs> you're too chicken shit. That Javier Bardem is going to go no country for old men on you. <laughs> you get that he's going to come and shoot you with that gun that he had. I just like to have fun with these, these type of things. You know, like I said, we, we, get, we get a lot of topics and, you know, kids and, and, and just we're celebrating Tiger Woods and Serena Williams. And um, I, I thought that would be a fun thing to talk about. I'm getting comments left and right on my phone. You know, oh, I can imagine. It's probably yeah. blowing up. Well, listen, listen, this one. This is from Casey Evans. Hey, Fish, if Rihanna walked in your shower, you'd have a heart attack. And you already are a nervous Jew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. All right, Dave. I don't know. I got nothing else. All righty. Well, folks, love having you with us again. We're Daily Fish. We're live on Facebook at daily.fish.5 on Monday, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. You can watch us on Facebook at Myrtle Beach Golf Channel, Myrtle Beach Grand Strand Life. You can check out Daily Fish on YouTube, Wingding TV. We're also on Hey Vegas TV. That's at heyvegastv.com. Let me finish this fish. You can come back and tell us. And listen to us on Spotify, Apple, iHeart, Stitcher, and Amazon. Also, you can use uh, those channels to find out about some of our great interviews coming up. Also, we just want to give you a, a, a heads up. Hope for the Warriors. Check out hopeforthewarriors.com. They have a big celebrity golf event. It's coming up very soon, August 27th, 29th. It'll be in Wallace, North Carolina, near Wilmington. Uh, we are definitely going to be there. And they take care of our wounded warriors, get them back working, get them back in their families. Great charity, great event. Johnny Bench is going to be there. Doug Flynn's going to be there. We're going to have a good time. Hopefully, we're going to be talking to Rick Saray, one of the rock stars, is going to be there soon. And that is hopeforthewarriors.org. Okay, we got a minute or two left. Fish, who just texted you? Marcus Moser texted me and said, I have a problem with you and Daily talking about Paul Passes. But I have three girls at my watch party right now looking at Hardline and saying, where does he live? <laughs> I thought I see Ford got in trouble on the show, but Hardline's address is. <laughs> Boy, Hard, Hardline's wife's going to come in and I'm done. You don't see me anymore. <laughs> yeah, you, you better ply her with drinks. Yeah, I will. I, uh, I'll tell you, I'll be fishing. I will be signing autographs at Shucks Tavern on Friday night. You come through and, and, and we'll take some pictures. There you go. They don't want anything to do with me, but they want you. There we go. Hey guys, real go. real quick, real quick on on the um on the NBA front, can you believe the ratings are phenomenal, phenomenal for the summer league and there's crowds here in Las Vegas. The NBA, you know, we talk about ratings all the time. Before we get out of here, I give props to Adam Silver because they had the crap going on with China, but the NBA ratings are up 13 to 14 percent all year and 22 percent in the playoffs. And to watch these young kids play in the summer league. We have to get out there, Hardline. We have to get out there one day. They're selling out Thomas and Mac, buddy. Whoever they're playing, they're selling out. Good stuff. Cool. All, All right. right. Good stuff, guys. Hey, have a good week. We'll be in touch. Thanks for watching, folks.